The first Battle of the Marne was a battle of the First World War fought from 6 to the 12th of September 1914. It resulted in an allied victory against the German armies in the west. The battle was the culmination of the retreat from Mons and pursuit of the Franco-British armies which followed the Battle of the Frontiers in August and reached the eastern outskirts of Paris. Field Marshal Sir John French, commander of the British Expeditionary Force, began to plan for a full British retreat to port cities on the English Channel for an immediate evacuation. The military governor of Paris, Joseph Simon Goluny, wanted the Franco-British units to counter-attack the Germans along the Marne River and halt the German advance. Allied reserves would restore the ranks and attack the German flanks. On 5 September, the counter-offensive by six French armies and the British Expeditionary Force began. By 9 September, the success of the Franco-British counter-offensive left the German first and second armies at risk of encirclement, and they were ordered to retreat to the Aisne River. The retreating armies were pursued by the French and British, although the pace of the Allied advance was slow, 12 miles in one day. The German armies ceased their retreat after 40 miles on a line north of the Aisne River, where they dug in on the heights and fought the First Battle of the Aisne. The German retreat between 9 September and 13 September marked the end of the attempt to defeat France by crushing the French armies with an invasion from the north through Belgium and in the south over the common border. Both sides commenced reciprocal operations to envelop the northern flank of their opponent, in what became known as the Race to the Sea which culminated in the First Battle of Ypres. Chapter 1 – Background Chapter 1 – Section 1 Battle of the Frontiers. The Battle of the Frontiers is a general name for all the operations of the French armies from 7 August to the 13th of September. A series of encounter battles began between the German, French and Belgian armies on the German-French frontier and in southern Belgium on the 4th of August. Liege was occupied by the Germans on the 7th of August. The first units of the British Expeditionary Force landed in France and French troops crossed the German frontier. The Battle of Mulhouse was the first French offensive of World War I. The French captured Mulhouse, until forced out by a German counter-attack on of August, and fell back toward Belfort. On 12 August, the Battle of Holland was fought by German and Belgian cavalry, and infantry, resulting in a Belgian defensive success. The BIF completed its move of four divisions and a cavalry division to France on 16 August, as the last Belgian fort of the fortified position of Liege surrendered. The Belgian government withdrew from Brussels on 18 August. The main French offensive, the Battle of Lorraine, began with the battles of Morhange and Saraburg advances by the First Army on Saraburg and the Second Army towards Morhange. Chateau Salan near Morhange was captured on 17 August and Saraburg the next day. The German 6th and 7th Armies counter-attacked on 20 August, and the 2nd Army was forced back from Morhange and the 1st Army, was repulsed at Saraburg. The German armies crossed the border and advanced on Nancy, but were stopped to the east of the city. The Belgian 4th Division, the solitary part of the Belgian army not to retreat to the defensive lines around Antwerp, dug in to defend Nama, which was besieged on 20 August. Further west, the French 5th Army had concentrated on the Sambre by 20 August, facing north on either side of Charleroi and east, towards Nama and Dinan. Additional support was given to the Belgians at Nama by the French 45th Infantry Brigade. On the left, the cavalry corps of General Saudet linked up with the Biff at Mons. To the south, the French retook Mulhouse on the 19th of August and then withdrew. By the 20th of August, a German counteroffensive in Lorraine had begun, and the German 4th and 5th armies advanced through the Ardennes on the 19th of August towards Neufchateau. An offensive by the French 3rd and 4th armies through the Ardennes began on the 20th of August in support of the French invasion of Lorraine. The opposing armies met in thick fog, the French mistook the German troops for screening forces. On the 22nd of August, the Battle of the Ardennes began with French attacks, which were costly to both sides and forced the French into a disorderly retreat late on the 23rd of August. 
The Third Army recoiled towards Verdun, pursued by the Fifth Army, and the Fourth Army retreated to Sedan and Stenay. Mulhouse was recaptured again by German forces and the Battle of the Meuse, caused a temporary halt of the German advance. Chapter 1 Section 2 The Great Retreat The Great Retreat took place from 24 August to 5 September, the French Fifth Army fell back about 15 kilometers from the Sambre during the Battle of Charleroi and began a greater withdrawal from the area south of the Sambre on 23 August. That evening, the 12,000 Belgian troops at Nama withdrew into French-held territory and at Dinan, 674 men, women and children were summarily executed by Saxon troops of the German Third Army, the first of several civilian massacres committed by the Germans in 1914. At the Battle of Mons, the Biff attempted to hold the line of the mons Condé Canal against the advancing German First Army. The British were eventually forced to withdraw due to being outnumbered by the Germans and the sudden retreat of the French Fifth Army, which exposed the British right flank. Though planned as a simple tactical withdrawal and executed in good order, the British retreat from Mons lasted for two weeks and covered 400 kilometers. During the retreat, Biff Commander Sir John French began to make contingency plans for a full retreat to the ports on the English Channel followed by an immediate British evacuation. On 1 September Lord Kitchener, the British Secretary of State for War, met with French, and ordered him not to withdraw to the Channel. The Biff retreated to the outskirts of Paris, before it counter-attacked in concert with the French, in the Battle of the Marne. The French First and Second Armies had been pushed back, by attacks of the German 7th and 6th Armies between saint die and Nancy. The 3rd Army held positions east of Verdun against attacks by the German 5th Army, the 4th Army held positions from the junction with the 3rd Army south of Montmédy, westwards to Sedan, Mezières, and Fiume, facing the German 4th Army, the 5th Army was between Fiume and Mabouge, the 3rd Army was advancing up the Meuse Valley from Dinon and Givet, into a gap between the 4th and 5th Armies and the 2nd Army pressed forward into the angle between the Meuse and Sambre, directly against the 5th Army. On the far west flank of the French, the Biff prolonged the line from Mabouge to Valenciennes against the German 1st Army and Army Detachment von Bissella masked the Belgian army at Antwerp. Dot on 26 August, German forces captured Valenciennes, and began the siege of Mabouge. Leuven, was sacked by German troops and the Battle of Le Cateau was fought by the Biff and the First Army. Lungui was surrendered by its garrison and next day, British Marines and a party of the Royal Naval Air Service landed at Ostend, German troops occupied Lille and Mezières. Arras was occupied on 27 August and a French counter-offensive began at the Battle of Saint-Quentin. On 29 August, the 5th Army counter-attacked the German 2nd Army south of the Waz, from Vervins to Mont d'Origny and west of the river from Mont d'Origny to Moy towards Saint-Quentin on the Somme, while the British held the line of the Waz west of La Ferre. German troops captured Lorn, La Ferre, and Roy on 30 August and Amiens the next day. On 1 September, the Germans entered Cron and Soissons. On 5 September German troops reached Clay Souli, 15 km from Paris, captured Reims and withdrew from Lille, and the Biff ended its retreat from Mons. Also on that day, French troops counter-attacked in the Battle of the Auk 5-12 September, marking the end of the great retreat of the western flank of the Franco-British armies. In the east, the Second Army had withdrawn its left flank, to face north between Nancy and Toul, the 1st and 2nd Armies had slowed the advance of the German 7th and 6th Armies west of saint Die and east of Nancy by the 4th of September. There was a gap between the left of the 2nd Army and the right of the 3rd Army at Verdun, which faced northwest, on a line towards Rivigny, against the 5th Army advance west of the Meuse between Varennes and saint menehold The 4th Army had withdrawn to Sermes, westwards to the Marne at vitry le francois and crossed the river to Sompons, against the German 4th Army, which had advanced from Rethel to Suips and the west of Chalons. The new French 9th Army held a line from Maille against the German 3rd Army, which had advanced from Mezières, over the Vel and the Marne west of Chalons. The 2nd Army had advanced from Marle on the Serre, across the Aisne and the Vel, 
between Reims and Fismes to Montmort, north of the junction of the French 9th and 5th armies at Cézanne. The 5th Army and the Biff had withdrawn south of the Waz, Serre, Ain, and Auerk, pursued by the German 2nd Army on a line from Guise to Lorn, Vailly, and Dormans and by the 1st Army from Montdidier, towards Compagne and then southeast towards Montmorail. French garrisons were besieged at Metz, Thionville, Lingui, Montmédy, and Mabouge. The Belgian army was invested at Antwerp in the National Redoubt and Belgian fortress troops continued the defence of the Liege forts. The military governor of Paris, General Joseph Goluny, was tasked with the defence of the city. Chapter 1 Section 3 Plans In the first days of September, the final decisions were made that were to directly create the circumstances for the Battle of the Marne. On the 2nd of September Moltke issued a grand directive changing the order of battle for the German attack. Moltke ordered that Paris would now be bypassed and the sweep intended to encircle the city would now seek to entrap the French forces between Paris and Verdun. To accomplish this, the second army would become the primary striking force with the first army following in echelon to protect the flank. At the time of this grand directive, Moltke based his decision on an intercepted radio transmission from the second army to the first army describing the Entente retreating across the Marne. On the eve of this most important battle, Moltke had requested situation reports from the first army on the 1st of September but received none. Both armies on the western flank had been depleted by the March and August battles. Moltke chose to reinforce the opposite wing that was attacking fortifications in the region near Verdun and Nancy. Kluck, whose army on the western flank had formerly been the force that would deliver the decisive blow, disregarded these orders. Together with his chief of staff General Kuhl, Kluck ordered his armies to continue southeast rather than turning to the west to face possible reinforcements that could endanger the German flank. They would seek to remain the wing of the German attack and to find and destroy the French 5th Army's flank. After setting this order in action on 2 September, Kluck did not transmit word to Moltke and OHL until the morning of 4 September, which Moltke ignored. Though in keeping with the pre-war tradition of decentralized command, Kluck disregarded the threat from the west. On 31 August, 1 September and 3 September, German aviators reported columns of French troops west of the First Army. These reports were dismissed and not passed to the 4th Reserve Corps. Joffrey sacked General Charles Lonrezac, the commander of the 5th Army and replaced him with I Corps commander Louis Franchet Desperet. Desperet became one of the originators of the Entente plan during the Battle of the Marne. On 4 September, while meeting with the British General Henry Wilson, Desperet outlined a French and British counterattack on the German First Army. The counterattack would come from the south by Desperet's Fifth Army, the west from the Biff and at the Auk River from Goluny's new Sixth Army. Goluny had come to the same conclusion on 3 September and had started marching the Sixth Army east. Joffrey spent much of this afternoon in silent contemplation under an ash tree. At dinner that night he received word of Desperet's plan for the counter-attack. That night he issued commands to halt the French retreat in his instruction general No. 5, to start on 6 September. The Biff was under no obligation to follow orders of the French. Joffrey first attempted to use diplomatic channels to convince the British government to apply pressure on French. Later in the day, he arrived at the Biff HQ for discussions which ended with Joffrey banging his hand dramatically on a table while shouting Monsieur le Maréchal, the honour of England is at stake. Following this meeting, French agreed to the operational plan to commence the following day. Chapter 2 – Battle Chapter 2 – Section 1 – Western Flank Late on the 4th of September, Joffrey ordered the 6th Army to attack eastwards over the Auk towards Chateau Thierry as the Biff advanced towards Montmorail, and the 5th Army attacked northwards with its right flank protected by the 9th Army along the St. Gond marshes. On 5 September, the Battle of the Auk commenced when the 6th Army advanced eastwards from Paris. 
That morning it came into contact with cavalry patrols of the 4th Reserve Corps of General Hans von Gronau, on the right flank of the 1st Army west of the Auerk River. Seizing the initiative in the early afternoon, the two divisions of 4 Reserve Corps attacked with field artillery and infantry into the gathering 6th Army and pushed it back. Overnight, the 4th Reserve Corps withdrew to a better position 10 kilometers east, while von Kluck, alerted to the approach of the Allied forces, began to wheel his army to face west. Gronau ordered the 2nd Corps to move back to the north bank of the Marne, which began a redeployment of all four First Army Corps to the north bank which continued until 8 September. The swift move to the north bank prevented the 6th Army from crossing the Auerk. In this move against the French threat from the west, von Kluck ignored the Franco-British forces advancing from the south against his left flank and opened a 50-kilometer gap in the German lines between the 1st Army and the 2nd Army on its left. Allied air reconnaissance observed German forces moving north to face the 6th Army and discovered the gap. The lack of coordination between von Kluck and Bullo caused the gap to widen further. On the night of September 7, Bullo ordered two of his corps to withdraw to favorable positions just hours before von Kluck ordered these same two corps to march to reinforce 1st Army on the Auerk River. At exactly the same time, Von Kluck and his influential staff officer Hermann von Kuhl had decided to break the French 6th Army on the 1st Army's right flank while Bullo shifted an attack to the 2nd Army's left wing, the opposite side from where the gap had opened. The Allies were prompt in exploiting the break in the German lines, sending the Biff and the 5th Army into the gap between the two German armies. The right wing of the 5th Army attacked on 6 September and pinned the 2nd Army in the Battle of the Two Morins named for the two rivers in the area, the Grand Morin and Petit Morin. The Biff advanced on 6-8 September, crossed the Petit Morin, captured bridges over the Marne, and established a bridgehead 8 kilometers deep. The slow pace of the Biff's advance enraged Desperet and other French commanders. On 6 September Haig's forces moved so slowly they finished the day 12 kilometers behind their objectives and lost only seven men. The Biff, though outnumbering Germans in the gap 10 to 1, advanced only 40 kilometers in three days. The 5th Army by the 8th of September crossed the Petit Morin, which forced Bullo to withdraw the right flank of the 2nd Army. The next day, the 5th Army recrossed the Marne, and the German 1st and 2nd Armies began to retire. The Germans had still hoped to smash the 6th Army between 6 and 8 September, but the 6th Army was reinforced on the night of 7-8 September by 10,000 French reserve infantry ferried from Paris. This included about 3,000 men from the 7th Division who were transported in a fleet of Paris taxicabs requisitioned by General Goluny. During the critical period of 6 to 7 September von Moltke issued no orders to either von Kluck or Bullo, and received no reports from them between 7 and 9 September. On the 6th of September, General Goluny gathered about 600 taxicabs at Les Invalides in central Paris to carry soldiers to the front at nontoy le hordouin 50 kilometers away. In the night of 6 to 7, two groups set off, the first, comprising 350 vehicles, departed at 10 p.m., and another of 250 an hour later. Each taxi carried five soldiers, four in the back and one next to the driver. Only the back lights of the taxis were lit, the drivers were instructed to follow the lights of the taxi ahead. Most of the taxis were demobilized on the 8th of September but some remained longer to carry the wounded and refugees. The taxis, following city regulations, dutifully ran their meters. The French treasury reimbursed the total fare of 70,012 francs. The arrival of 6,000 soldiers by taxi has traditionally been described as critical in stopping a possible German breakthrough against the 6th Army. However, in General Goluny's memoirs, he notes how some had exaggerated somewhat the importance of the taxis. In 2001, Strachan described the course of the battle without mentioning taxis and in 2009, Herwig called the matter a legend, he wrote that many French soldiers travelled in lorries and all the artillery left Paris by train. The impact on morale was undeniable, 
the taxis de la Marne were perceived as a manifestation of the Union Sacre of the French civilian population and its soldiers at the front, reminiscent of the people in arms who had saved the French Republic campaign of 1794, a symbol of unity and national solidarity beyond their strategical role in the battle. It was also the first large-scale use of motorized infantry in battle, a Marne taxicab is prominently displayed in the exhibit on the Battle of the Musée de l'Armée at Les Invalides in Paris. The reinforced 6th Army held its ground. The following night, on 8 September, the 5th Army launched a surprise attack against the 2nd Army, further widening the gap between the 1st and 2nd Armies. Moltke, at OHL in Luxembourg, was effectively out of communication with the German and Army HQs. He sent his intelligence officer, Oberstleutnant Richard Hench to visit the HQs. On 8 September, Hench met with Bullo, and they agreed that the Second Army was in danger of encirclement, and would retreat immediately. On 9 September, Hench reached the First Army's HQ, met with von Kluck's chief of staff, and issued orders for the First Army to retreat to the Aisne River. Von Kluck and von Kuhl vigorously objected to this order as they believed their army was on the verge of breaking the Sixth Army. However, Hench reminded them he had the full power of the OHL behind him, and that Second Army was already in retreat. Von Kluck reluctantly ordered his troops to pull back. Moltke suffered a nervous breakdown upon hearing of the danger. His subordinates took over and ordered a general retreat to the Aisne, to regroup for another offensive. The Germans were pursued by the French and British, although the pace of the exhausted Allied forces was slow and averaged only 19 km per day. The Germans ceased their retreat after 65 km, at a point north of the Aisne River, where they dug in, preparing trenches. By 10 September the German armies west of Verdun were retreating towards the Aisne. Joffrey ordered Allied troops to pursue, leading to the First Battle of the Aisne. The German retreat from 9 to 13 September marked the end of the Schlieffen Plan. Moltke is said to have reported to the Kaiser, Your Majesty, we have lost the war. Whether General von Moltke actually said to the Emperor, Majesty, we have lost the war, we do not know. We know anyhow that with a prescience greater in political than in military affairs, he wrote to his wife on the night of the 9th, things have not gone well. The fighting east of Paris has not gone in our favor, and we shall have to pay for the damage we have done. Chapter 2 Section 2 Eastern Flank The German 3rd, 4th and 5th armies attacked the French 2nd, 3rd, 4th and 9th armies in the vicinity of Verdun beginning 5-6 September. German attacks against the Second Army south of Verdun from 5 September almost forced the French to retreat. Southeast of Verdun, the Third Army was forced back to the west of Verdun by German attacks on the Meuse Heights, but maintained contact with Verdun and the Fourth Army to the west. Other the fighting included the capture of the village of Rivigny in the Battle of Rivigny, the Battle of Vitry around Vitry-le-Francois, and the Battle of the Marshes of saint gond around Cézanne. On 7 September German advances created a salient south of Verdun at saint miel which threatened to separate the 2nd and 3rd armies. General Castle now prepared to abandon the French position around Nancy, but his staff contacted Joffrey, who ordered Castle now to hold for another 24 hours. German attacks continued through the 8th of September but soon began to taper off as Moltke began shifting troops to the west. By the 10th of September the Germans had received orders to stop attacking and withdrawal towards the frontier became general. Chapter 3, Aftermath Chapter 3 Section 1, Analysis At the start of the war, both sides had plans that they counted on to deliver a short war. The Battle of the Marne was the second great battle on the Western Front, after the Battle of the Frontiers, and one of the most important events of the war. While the German invasion failed decisively to defeat the Entente in France, the German army occupied a good portion of northern France as well as most of Belgium, and it was the failure of the French Plan 17 that caused that situation. 
It is generally agreed among historians that the battle was an allied victory that saved Paris and kept France in the war but there is considerable disagreement as to the extent of the victory. Joffrey, whose planning had led to the disastrous Battle of the Frontiers, was able to bring the Entente to a tactical victory. He used interior lines to move troops from his right wing to the critical left wing and sacked generals. Due to the redistribution of French troops, the German First Army had 128 battalions facing 191 battalions of the French and Biff. The Second and Third German Armies had 134 battalions facing 268 battalions of the French Fifth and New Ninth Army. It was his orders that prevented Castle now from abandoning Nancy on 6 September or reinforcing that army when the pivotal battle was unfolding on the other side of the battlefield. He resisted counter-attacking until the time was right then put his full force behind it. Desperay should also receive credit as the author of the main stroke. As Joffrey says in his memoirs, it was he who made the Battle of the Marne possible. After the Battle of the Marne, the Germans retreated for up to 90 kilometers and lost 11,717 prisoners, 30 field guns and 100 machine guns to the French and 3,500 prisoners to the British before reaching the Aisne. The German retreat ended their hope of pushing the French beyond the Verdun-Marne-Paris line and winning a quick victory. Following the battle and the failures by both sides to turn the opponent's northern flank during the race to the sea, the war of movement ended with the Germans and the Allied powers facing each other across a stationary front line. Both sides were faced with the prospect of costly siege warfare operations if they chose to continue an offensive strategy in France. Historians' interpretations characterize the Allied advance as a success. John Terrain wrote that nowhere, and at no time, did it present the traditional aspect of victory, but nonetheless stated that the French and British stroke into the breach between the first and second German armies made the Battle of the Marne the decisive battle of the war. Barbara W. Tuckman and Robert A. Doughty wrote that Joffrey's victory at the Marne was far from decisive, Tuckman calling it an incomplete victory of the Marne. And Doughty opportunity for a decisive victory had slipped from his hands. Ian Sumner called it a flawed victory and that it proved impossible to deal the German armies a decisive blow. Tuckman wrote that Kluck explained the German failure at the Marne as the reason that transcends all others was the extraordinary and peculiar aptitude of the French soldier to recover quickly. That men will let themselves be killed where they stand, that is well known and counted on in every plan of battle. But that men who have retreated for ten days, sleeping on the ground and half dead with fatigue, should be able to take up their rifles and attack when the bugle sounds, is a thing upon which we never counted. It was a possibility not studied in our war academy. Richard Brooks in 2000, wrote that the significance of the battle centers on its undermining of the Schlieffen plan, which forced Germany to fight a two-front war against France and Russia, the scenario that its strategists had long feared. Brooks claimed that, by frustrating the Schlieffen plan, Joffrey had won the decisive battle of the war, and perhaps of the century. The Battle of the Marne was also one of the first battles in which reconnaissance aircraft played a decisive role, by discovering weak points in the German lines, which the Entente armies were able to exploit. Chapter 3 Section 2 Casualties Over two million men fought in the First Battle of the Marne and although there are no exact official casualty counts for the battle, estimates for the actions of September along the Marne front for all armies are often given as C.A. 500,000 killed or wounded. French casualties totaled 250,000 men, of whom 80,000 were killed. Some notable people died in the battle, such as Charles Peggy, who was killed while leading his platoon during an attack at the beginning of the battle. Tuckman gave French casualties for August as 206,515 from Armée Française and Herwig gave French casualties for September as 213,445, also from Armée Française for a total of just under 420,000 in the first two months of the war. According to Roger Chickering, German casualties for the 1914 campaigns on the Western Front were 500,000. 
British casualties were 13,000 men, with 1,700 killed. The Germans suffered ca. 250,000 casualties. No future battle on the Western Front would average so many casualties per day. In 2009, Herwig re estimated the casualties for the battle. He wrote that the French official history, Les Armées Françaises dans la Grande Guerre, gave 213,445 French casualties in September and assumed that ca. 40% occurred during the Battle of the Marne. Using the German Sanitatsbericht, Herwig recorded that from 1 to 10 September, the First Army had 13,254 casualties, the Second Army had 10,607 casualties, the Third Army had 14,987 casualties, the Fourth Army had 9,433 casualties, the Fifth Army had 19,434 casualties, the Sixth Army had 21,200 casualties and the Seventh Army had 10,164 casualties. Herwig estimated that the five German armies from Verdun to Paris had 67,700 casualties during the battle and assumed 85,000 casualties for the French. Herwig wrote that there were 1,701 British casualties. Herwig estimated 300,000 casualties for all sides at the Marne but questioned whether isolating the battle was justified. In 2010, Ian Sumler wrote that there were 12,733 British casualties, including 1,700 dead. Sumler cites the same overall casualty figure for the French for September as Herwig from Armée Française, which includes the losses at the Battle of the Aisne, as 213,445 but provides a further breakdown, 18,073 killed. 111,963 wounded and 83,409 missing. Chapter 3 Section 3 Subsequent Operations Chapter 3 Section 3 Subsection 2 First Battle of the Aisne, 13-28 September On 10 September, Joffrey ordered the French armies and the Biff to advance and for four days, the armies on the left flank moved forward and gathered up German stragglers, wounded and equipment, opposed only by rearguards. On 11 and 12 September, Joffrey ordered outflanking maneuvers by the armies on the left flank but the advance was too slow to catch the Germans, who ended their withdrawal on 14 September, on high ground on the north bank of the Aisne and began to dig in. Frontal attacks by the 9th, 5th, and 6th armies were repulsed from 15 to 16 September. This led Joffrey to transfer the 2nd army west to the left flank of the 6th army, the first phase of allied attempts to outflank the German armies in the race to the sea. French troops had begun to move westwards on 2 September, using the undamaged railways behind the French front, which were able to move a corps to the left flank in 5 to 6 days. On 17 September, the French 6th Army attacked from Soissons to Mouillon, at the westernmost point of the French flank, with the 13 and 4 Corps, which were supported by the 61st and 62nd Divisions of the 6th Group of Reserve Divisions. After this, the fighting moved north to La Sainte and the French dug in around Nampsel. The French 2nd Army completed a move from Lorraine, and took over command of the left-hand corps of the 6th Army, as indications appeared that German troops were also being moved from the eastern flank. The German 9 Reserve Corps arrived from Belgium by 15 September and the next day joined the 1st Army for an attack to the southwest, with the 4th Corps and the 4th and 7th Cavalry Divisions, against the attempted French envelopment. The attack was cancelled, and the 9th Reserve Corps was ordered to withdraw behind the right flank of the 1st Army. The 2nd and 9th Cavalry Divisions were dispatched as reinforcements the next day but before the retirement began, the French attack reached Carlepont and Nouillon, before being contained on 18 September. The German armies attacked from Verdun westwards to Reims and the Aisne at the Battle of Fleury, cut the main railway from Verdun to Paris and created the saint miel salient, south of the Verdun fortress zone. The main German effort remained on the western flank, which was revealed to the French by intercepted wireless messages. By 28 September, 
the Ain front had stabilized and the BIF began to withdraw on the night of 1-2nd of October, with the first troops arriving in the Abhil on the Somme on the night of 8-9th of October. The BIF prepared to commence operations in French Flanders and Flanders in Belgium, joining with the British forces that had been in Belgium since August. Chapter 3 Section 3 Subsection 3 Race to the Sea from 17 September 17 October, the belligerents made reciprocal attempts to turn the northern flank of their opponent. Joffrey ordered the French 2nd Army to move to the north of the French 6th Army, by moving from eastern France from 2 to 9 September, and Falkenhayn, who had replaced Moltke on 14 September, ordered the German 6th Army to move from the German French border to the northern flank on 17 September. By the next day, French attacks north of the Aisne led Falkenhayn to order the 6th Army to repulse the French and secure the flank. The French advance at the First Battle of Picardy met a German attack rather than an open flank and by the end of the Battle of Albert, the 2nd Army had been reinforced to 8 Corps but was still opposed by German forces at the Battle of Arras, rather than advancing around the German northern flank. The German 6th Army had also found that on arrival in the north, it was forced to oppose the French attack rather than advance around the flank and that the secondary objective, to protect the northern flank of the German armies in France, had become the main task. By 6 October, the French needed British reinforcements to withstand German attacks around Lille. The Biff had begun to move from the Aisne to Flanders on 5 October and reinforcements from England assembled on the left flank of the 10th Army, which had been formed from the left flank units of the 2nd Army on 4 October. The Allied powers and the Germans attempted to take more ground after the open northern flank had disappeared. The Franco British attacks towards Lille in October at the battles of La Bassee, Vizines, and Armentieres were followed up by attempts to advance between the Biff and the Belgian army by a new French 8th Army. The moves of the 7th and then the 6th Army from Alsace and Lorraine had been intended to secure German lines of communication through Belgium, where the Belgian army had sorted several times, during the period between the Great Retreat and the Battle of the Marne, in August, British Marines had landed at Dunkirk. In October, a new 4th Army was assembled from the 3rd Reserve Corps, the siege artillery used against Antwerp, and four of the new Reserve Corps training in Germany. A German offensive began by 21 October but the 4th and 6th armies were only able to take small amounts of ground, at great cost to both sides at the Battle of the Isar and further south in the First Battle of Ypres. Falkenhayn then attempted to achieve a limited goal of capturing Ypres and Mont Kemmel.